My talk today is going to be on a project called Project Kawa, which I'm doing in first in Brazil and then hopefully throughout the rest of Latin America. It may have some usefulness in other areas around the world. We'll talk a little bit about why or why not that might happen. For those of you that don't know me, uh-oh, let's see. Oh, yeah. For those of you that don't know me, my undergraduate degree was half in electrical engineering and half in business. And I had, at that time, a minor in some computer courses. And that's because there wasn't any computer science major at that time. I've been in the computer industry since 1969, had a variety of different systems. I've had a variety of different jobs. And I've been everything from a programmer to technical marketing. I don't, don't boo. And uh, had a variety of things. But I've worked, most importantly, as a vendor, trying to give people new features and help and things like that. And as a customer who's been waiting for those new features and those little things that make life better. Now, a lot of you have never been to Brazil. How many of you have ever been to Brazil? Ah, OK. So most of you haven't been to Brazil. I have a little game. Let's play a little game. What do you think of when you think of Brazil? You know, what? That's good. You might think of piranha. You know, piranha uh, in the Amazon River. You might think of football. You know, they're crazy about soccer in Brazil. You know, you might think about beaches. You might think about Rio de Janeiro. And you might think about carnival. OK. But a lot of you don't think about the fact that Sao Paulo is actually the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere, only after Mexico City. It actually has a density that's 12 times the density of Manhattan. You can see all the tall apartment buildings and tall office buildings and things like that. And Sao Paulo is only one of the urban areas in Brazil. There's Manaus, Curitiba, Porto Alegre, a lot of different ones. And actually, 86% of the people in Brazil live in what is considered to be an urban environment and a very dense urban environment. It's also an urban environment where you tend to have very rich people next to very poor people. They have what they call favelas. And you've heard that in Rio de Janeiro they've been having trouble with the favelas where there's a lot of drug dealing going on and stuff like that. Well, believe me, that drug dealing is done by perhaps 1% of the population. The rest of the people that live in the favelas are just trying to get by. And they just don't have any money or the training that they need for the jobs. They come from the countryside to the city to get those jobs. And then when they get there, they find out there are no jobs to be had. And often, the internet is not 500 miles away from them. It's only 50 feet away. If we could bridge that last 50 feet, we could bring them information and training and things like that to get people the jobs that they need. Now, one more definition. And I think that this might even fit some of the people in the room. This is you. You're a geek. You're a systems administrator. You like solving problems. You like being, you know, in, in working with machines, you know. Believe it or not, you are a strange people because 99% of the population actually hates doing that type of stuff. They actually hate working with computers because they don't know how to use them and it's too hard for whatever they do and they use them only because they have to. Now, Brazilians also have geeks. Notice they look a lot the same. And they have the same aspirations and things. But what they would also like to do is they would like to have their own business. They like to have their own job. They like to be an entrepreneur. And there's a lot of entrepreneurial people in Brazil. They really are. You see them all the time. They're always looking for a way to make money. So I started going down to Brazil in 1996. I've been going down there several times a year ever since, talking to them about free software. The government has been using free software for a long time and doing things, and a lot of industry is using free software. Free software runs their lottery system. Free software runs their welfare system. Free software runs a lot of their banking systems, their subway system. Their, the world's largest hydroelectric plant, Itupu, runs with free software. So they have a lot of that, and they'd really like to learn how can they use free software to make a living? Oh, my battery must be getting low. Come on, baby. There we go. Okay. 
So the goals of Project Kawa is to create millions of new high-tech jobs in Brazil alone and millions more through the rest of Latin America, including Central America and Mexico. Another goal is to make computers easier to use, and I'll explain a little bit more about each one of these points a little bit later. To create more environmentally friendly computing, I'm going to show you why what we're doing right now is really quite horrible. To decrease cellular contention, there's an is interesting issue. In New York City, you can no longer make a 3G cellular telephone call. That's because too many people are downloading porn. That is obviously why the internet was created, you know. And uh, they're doing it. And as fast as the AT&T and the rest of them put up more 3G antennas, more people download porn, okay? Because they have more iPhones and more Android phones. And they, there it goes again, download porn, okay? <laughs> So, you know, we're going, to try, we're going to decrease that cellular contention by creating millions more antennas, and I'll show you how we do that. We're going to create a completely gratis Wi-Fi bubble over these large urban areas so people can take an inexpensive Wi-Fi device and connect to the Internet and get the training they want and need. We can also create a low-cost or gratis supercomputer grid. And we're going to do all of this using open hardware, open software, and open business practices, and doing it in a sustainable way without any government funding. Now, the model of how we do this, in a nutshell, with apologies to O'Reilly, is to take highly available servers and put them in the basement of all those tall buildings. Put them in the basement of, of centers for uh, you know, uh, malls and things like that, and then utilize thin clients throughout there in the place of desktop computers. One of the other interesting things about Brazil is, for some reason or another, they don't really believe in central air conditioning. When you have an air-conditioned place, it's typically done with a whole bunch of individual little units stuck up on the wall, and they're blowing the hot air out and blowing the cold air in. Well, then down on the desk, they have all these very expensive electric space heaters called PCs, and they're busy creating the hot air. And unlike North America, where we tend to be all above the equator, and therefore during a certain time of the year, and we're in Boston, it's great to see this, where you could actually appreciate those expensive space heaters for making your feet warm, Brazil kind of straddles the equator. So a large portion of it is warm all the time, and the more that they generate in heat, the more they have to expel with these relatively inefficient air conditioners. So we want to use these thin clients to help reduce the amount of electricity used, therefore the amount of heat that's used, not only to run the computers, but also to, uh, to keep it better with the air conditioning. Now we can also support FAT clients with this because Linux supports Samba as a network. And so we, to people who have Windows systems and people who have uh, Apple systems, we can provide services in the way of file uh, retention and backup, spam filtering, virus filtering, things like that. We can do that for them. Uh, however, they're going to have to pay for the licenses which they use. Now, this is another interesting thing about Latin America because Brazil pirates 84% of its software. Okay? And, you know, when I go down there and talk to them about using free software, they go, oh, mad dog, all of our software is free. <laughs> and I says, well, yeah, free until the BSA shows up, and I'm not talking about the Boy Scouts of America, okay? So uh, they, they have a problem, and they know it. As they get closer and closer to World Trade Organization and these different trade packs and stuff, and more and more pressure is put on them to, to solve this problem, there's going to be more and more of them having to pay for the software which they're using. Now, the interesting thing about software piracy is that the lower your GDP, typically the higher the rate of software piracy is. So Vietnam typically pirates 96% of its software. Beijing used, or China used to pirate 96%, but because of the WTO, they had to go down to only 84%. And the United States, one of the richest countries in the world until next election time, uh, we pirate 34% of our software. So we're not completely... Uh, you know, innocent of that either. 
Now these SYN clients are, are going to be connected to the server by high throughput Ethernet and powered with power over Ethernet. So all the SYN clients will be able to run from power that's provided by the servers with battery backup in the basement of the building. And if the grid power goes off for too long a period of a time, then there will be a generator down there which will start up to charge the batteries again. So this is going to be, the thin clients will always be on because they're going to be the security system, they're going to be the telephone system, they're going to be the calendar, the alarm clock, they're going to run the household, they're going to be on all the time. And finally, the HPC grid is going to be formed by all these servers which are on all the time. And the systems administrator entrepreneur is going to own this as a business and supply the services of computing to the people in the building. Now this is why we're going to be creating these millions of new high-tech jobs. It's going to allow these systems administrators to own their own companies, to work the hours they want to work. And a lot of you have worked with diskless workstations before. You know that if you set them up right with the proper, in the proper way, you can monitor a lot of these systems with a relatively small amount of effort. You can maintain the systems. There are cases of Linux terminal server projects installations that have had 22,000 separate logins with 5,000 separate clients on 64 different servers using only one and a half systems administrators. I don't know where they found the one half the systems administrator, but that's how it works out. What we want to do is have about 300 thin clients monitored by one person and through that generate enough revenue to give them a very good job for the Brazilian economy. And we'll talk more about the Brazilian economy later. The systems administrator is going to be going out and finding customers. Maybe they're living in an apartment building and they'll say, I'll talk to the rest of the people in my apartment building about where they want to buy these services or not. Or they'll see an office building close by and they'll go there and they'll say, I can provide you these services if you sign up for this. And they will take all this information to their local bank, they will borrow the money to buy the equipment, have it installed, and then go into business selling computing services to people. In other words, we're going to take the geek and put a tie on them. <laughs> now this is my mother and father. Mom and dad died this year. Dad was 88. Mom was, well, I'm not allowed to say even now how old she was. <laughs> but they had a problem in using computers because my father's idea of a backup was something he did with a car to put in a parking place. And my mother's idea of a virus is something you treated with chicken soup. Okay. Both of them could use the computer in doing their everyday stuff, email, you know, sending, surfing the web and things like that. But the stuff that they did every once in a while was really alien to them and they kept forgetting. So, and that's the way that most people are. Most people can do the stuff that they do every day. But when you tell them to do something like update their computer system, or you tell them to do something like do a backup, they forget, they don't remember. And this is one of the things that the systems administrator is going to be able to do for them. The other thing that's a problem in the computing industry is that over the last 40 years, we've been moving support further and further away from the end user. Originally, support was, when I started out, if I had a question, I turned to the person next to me because they had a master's degree or PhD in computer science. If we couldn't figure it out, we turned to the person on the other side who had a master's degree or PhD in computer science. And believe it or not, things were a lot simpler back in those days because we didn't have networking and 3D graphics and surround sound and a whole bunch of other stuff. So then, all of a sudden, they said, well, you know, the support center is down in the basement of the building. That's where we're going to put the operations people and we're going to train them to the teeth. You guys are just doing the programming in the applications area. Then they started to put the support out at the people who were selling you the programs, the manufacturers, and you had to call them up. And now you have to call people in India or worse yet, West Texas. And neither one of them can you understand. <laughs> and so for the most part, people go along and they're spending like eight hours on the telephone saying, Howdy, partner! I don't understand a word you've been saying, but I'll just talk like you do. Okay? And it's wasted time. Now what would happen if they could just sit down with the person and say, This is what I'm doing. And the person says, oh, you're, it's because you're moving your mouse this way. You need to move your mouse that way. Oh, okay. In just a few minutes, they had their problem solved. 
where that person was responsible for doing their backups, or do, getting rid of the viruses, getting rid of the spam, making sure their systems were upgraded properly. That person could also be looking out for new programs to help their customers do their business better. And that is what the job of the systems administrator entrepreneur is going to be. Now, if we have 1.5 billion desktop computers in the world, that's an accurate figure, um, if we waste an average of $5 every day because our computer doesn't work the way it should, that means we're losing as a world economy $7.5 billion every day. Now, APC estimates that we lose $268 million a day simply because we have flickers of electricity that go off, have our systems crash because they don't have a UPS attached to them that's working properly. That's only that, $265 million every day we lose as a world economy. We don't see that because it's lost $5 at a time. It disappears in the woodwork. But if you had 300 people working for you as knowledge workers, and they all lost $5 a day or 15 minutes a day, that means it's like nine people just never showed up for work. They didn't call in sick. They went on vacation. They just never showed up. And you as a manager, you'd be absolutely about that, OK? You'd be really, really angry. But there's nothing you can do. What if you took one of those people and trained them to be a really good systems administrator so that magically four other people showed up for work? That would be a worthwhile investment. And that's what we're going to do. Now, the interesting thing about Brazil is that they have small to medium business just like we do. It's just that their small to medium business is one to 30 people, whereas ours tends to be one to 50 people for small business. Medium business is 50 to 500 for us. It's 30 to 300 for them. But in all of those tall buildings, a lot of those buildings, you'll find 40 or 50 different companies, each one of have five or six people working for them. And they can't afford to have a well-trained, tuned systems administrator for each company. But if you would allow them to share that systems administrator and be able to utilize their services, they'd be able to do that. Oh. The other thing, neat thing about support and why it keeps moving further away from us is because the people who are involved with providing support are never the ones that use it. There's only two groups of people that are involved with providing support. The people that actually provide it as a business and the people who buy it. That's the purchasing agent. They never use the support. You know, they have somebody else that they complain to. And the person that's providing it always wants to provide the cheapest possible support because that's how they win the business. The people that actually use it, the end users, they never have anything to say about it. That's a problem. So with Project Kawa, we're going to go after several vertical markets. Small to medium business market, I just described, and there's buildings with very small companies in them, providing them with a virtualized system. If you want to think of it as a local cloud, you can. Okay. And apartments and condominiums, providing them with a whole series of different services. We'll get to that in a moment in depth. Hospitality, hotels, restaurants. In Brazil, there's a lot of very small hotels. We call them pousadas. And they are ones that you know, would love to have the services that you have in a large hotel, but they can't afford them. You have a whole bunch of wireless network nodes that are there that never work because nobody knows how to take care of them. And other things. We'll get a little bit more into that later on. And finally, point of sale terminals. A lot of the cash registers you see in stores in Brazil are typically a standard PC hooked up using a lot of electrical power for nothing. Let's look at, look at apartments and condominiums. What, we can, what can we can offer them with Project Kawa? Regular desktop computing, connection to the internet, office stuff, things like that. Over the air digital TV, both for downloading data through unused channels. We can do that. IP TV, being able to listen to TV programs from all over the world. IP radio, same thing. Voice over IP, you know, asterisk-based systems. Control, control of lights and heat in the apartment to turn on and off those air conditioning units. Security system, be able to store their pictures, their music, the calendar, and their alarm clock. All these different things we can offer them. All of the software for this exists in free and open source software right now. It's just it has to be integrated. 
Let's take a look at the hospitality functionality. A little hotel, remember it's a very tiny hotel, maybe 10, 15 rooms, reservation system, a room allocation system for them, an accounting, all the types of things that they need to be able to provide it for them. All of this is already available in free software. To give them point of sale terminals with handhelds to help their staff work better. And in room, all the things we talked about before in the apartment. Okay? And this eliminates the need to have the alarm clock and the tel telephone and the TV and all stuff, one unit that would do everything. Now here's another thing about hotels. 70% of the in-room uh, money, revenues, made in a hotel is actually X-rated movies. So I go to these little hotels, I talk about all these neat things I can give them, they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I say, X-rated movies, and they go, I'll buy it. <laughs> Small and medium business market we talked about before. We can provide support for all three major operating systems, BSD2, and we can create, in effect, a time-sharing system for them. As far as I was concerned, time sharing was the epitome of usage of computers, where all you had to do was sit down, log in, and run your program. You didn't have to worry about doing backups or anything else. There was somebody else that did that for you. They were called operators. It was great. We want to do environmentally friendly computing. Reduce the amount of electricity used, lengthen the life of computers from three years to nine years, uh, have an active resale and recycling program, and reduce bad chemicals in the computers. This picture here is Itupu. It is the world's largest hydroelectric plant. It generates 14 gigawatts of electricity. If each desktop computer used 350 watts of electricity, which is about the average, that means it can power 40 million desktops. The problem is that Brazil has 192 million people, so it's a kind of a shortage here. Now, that's just to run the computers. Like I said before, we also have to run the air conditioners. And there's a rule of thumb that says for every watt of heating that you do, you need two watts of air conditioning. So in reality, we can only drive an even smaller number of computers. And that, if that was the only thing that Itupu was, was built for, then it would still be bad. But Itupu is supposed to do other things. We want to have thin clients use 10 watts or less. These are not just the thin clients that just display things. These are real thin clients that can actually do real work. They can support virtualization. They have, they have GPUs that can do all of the hardware decoding of the, of the video in hardware, so there's no strain on the, on the regular CPU. Two threads going on. They're very, very capable systems. And they're also generated with completely green. So there's no harmful chemicals in them. They exist today. They use typically in embedded systems in cars. They can run at 70 degrees Celsius temperature without any fan. We don't want to have any fan. We don't want to have any disk because that creates noise and waste electricity and reduces the lifetime of the unit. We don't even want to have a battery for the time of year clock because the battery has to be replaced every so often. When this thing boots up because it's connected to the internet, it will get the time that's booting from the internet. It doesn't need the battery to keep the clock alive. We would have all USB 3.0 because why else, you know, what would we have otherwise? We're going to have it hardwired with the at least 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, if not higher, and power over Ethernet supplying the power to the system. So this is, has a very, very long life. As we need different types of interfaces, we'll plug those into the USB 3.0 ports. So we can have a serial port, we can have a parallel port, we can have even a separate video screen through USB 3.0 dongles, which exist today. Another thing we want to do is build these thin clients locally in Brazil. Today, most of the things happen in Brazil come from Taiwan, motherboards, things like that. The problem is that the Brazilian government has a 100% duty on the things coming in, 100% of the value of the part, including shipping. So if the shipping costs 10 bucks, you're going to pay $20 extra because it's of the duty. So this thing makes things very expensive in Brazil. We want to design these at the University of Sao Paulo. That's what USP stands for, University of Sao Paulo. They have 100,000 students and 16,000 PhDs. They have an ability to have a fab plant to build integrated circuits, and they have an SMT line that can build motherboards. They're going to build 10,000 uh, units for us, 
After that, they have to turn it over to a local manufacturer because after that, it's no longer a research and development project. It is a manufacturing project. When we turn it over to the local manufacturers, they'll license it out for 2 to $4 a board, which means that they'll be able to recover their development costs and go on to design the next thing. There's about 800 small companies in Brazil that have SMT lines, surface metal technology lines, to build these boards, and they can compete with each other on the manufacturing prowess to build these and also other parts so that the price of these boards will be kept dramatically low. I, I forgot to mention that the import duty on parts to build something in Brazil is 6%, not 100%. So if you, if you bring it in completely manufactured, it's 100% duty on the value. If you bring it in as parts, it's 6% duty on the parts coming in. So we can build the printed circuit board in Brazil, lowers transportation costs, things like that. We only have to bring in the parts that are not manufactured in Brazil. We want to have an open BIOS and open drivers because this thing has to last a long time, nine to 10 years. Everybody's worked with BIOS manufacturers, know that they lose interest 20 seconds after the board ships. Uh, why, why do this? Again, because of import duty and also to create jobs and expertise inside of Brazil to do this. It's very dangerous for large, company, large countries to depend completely upon some other country for something as critical as their computer devices. Uh, we want to resell and recycle these. We're going to have three different size servers. I call them Baby Bear, Mama Bear, and Papa Bear. Mama Bear and Papa Bear are very easy. They're just generic, Intel-based, instruction set-based systems with everything as much generic as possible so that we can support with free software. Baby Bear is actually made up of two thin clients hooked together, running off of 12 volts. I forgot to mention that the thin clients work off of 12 volts because we have a problem. We bring in voltage from the wall at 115 volts. We bring it into our UPS. We take it down to 12 volts to charge the batteries. We bring it back up to 115 to run it into the system. We bring it down to 12 volts to run the system. It's a little bit crazy, folks. 12 volts in, done, okay? In any case, the baby bears, and the other thing about 12 volts is it's a universal voltage. Alternators in cars work off of 12 volts. You can have 12 volt solar cells, 12 volt refrigerators, 12 volt air conditioners, even 12 volt microwaves. So we're gonna run it off of 12 volts so you can use it in your car, you can use it in your boat, you can use it in a little cabin in the woods, stuff like that. You may have to pump your bicycle really fast, but you'll be able to power it, okay? Hook the two baby bears together to make a highly available server using USB 3.0 to get to have your disk supplies and your wireless off of USB 3.0, stuff like that. And if, if one of your baby bear server modules goes bad, you sacrifice a thin client, you replace it to make it stable, and you send it back to have it repaired. Now, this wireless mesh thing, I keep saying a wireless mesh. This is actually a wireless LAN. The problem with mesh is you have so many hops that people are depending on to go from whoever the client is to wherever you have a backhaul to get into the system you can actually uh, do quality of service on it. We believe that by having enough of these units be wired in and having the backhauls that the most you ever have to hop is twice and most of the time you only have to hop to the, to the router itself. So the number of hops you have and your throughput is up, your latency is down, and that you'd be able to have very good service. We want to still have it be a, a mesh just in case you're a little bit further away so you can survive a couple hops. But for the most part, every single thin client, every single point of, sam of sale terminal is going to be a wired mesh repeater with a backhaul. So that's a lot of them. The supercomputer grid is from the other side. I've been talking with the telephone companies in Brazil about supplying us with a lot of uh, internet. And the problem that they're having right now is they'd love to be able to bring fiber to every apartment in those tall apartment buildings. But when they do, they bring it into one apartment. And they would have to charge that apartment owner $1,500 to make that connection. And nobody wants to pay that. Well, what they're doing with Project Cowers are bringing it into the basement of the apartment that one time, and it's up to Project Cower to distribute it to all the other people in the apartment house. So all of them get high-speed internet at the same time. 
This makes it economically feasible for the telephone companies to do this, and they're very happy with Project Kawa. Now, likewise, with all that internet there, and all those servers have the capability of forming a grid. And this allows us to be able to sell some of the idle CPU cycles to companies or universities, stuff like that, that want to do grid projects. Now, what about the training of this? Um, we estimate that we'll need about 2 million new systems administrators in Brazil alone, with another 3 to 4 million systems administrators in the rest of Latin America. To try and do training with that in any normal way would be horrible. So we're going to make all of our training available over the net, and we're going to make it so that people get certification over the net instead of you know, having to go to a classroom and get training otherwise. We're forming an apprenticeship program to allow people to use apprenticeship to be able to get ha actual hands-on experience by working with an already existing assistant administrator entrepreneur. Uh, we will have specialized training for specialized tasks, for example, installation. Not every, you know, in any given building, you're only going to be doing a major installation project one time. So we will have companies trained to do that type of, of work, which is specialized. Once that is done, they turn over the installed system to the systems administrator for maintaining it. And we will have all the traditional types of training available. We're also going to have these people licensed by the government and bonded by insurance companies, because these people will be supplying things like telephony service, you will know, be security service. They have to be licensed and bonded. This is a serious job. We want them to know that they screw up and badly, that they could have their license taken away, and they could lose their business. We will do second level support training for things through forums and mailing lists and telephone support. We're going to create a community of these systems administrators to do this. We want them to also know this is a lifelong learning task, as you all know. You don't just do a little bit of learning one time and that's it. They have to know that they're going to be learning for the rest of their lives from this project. So how much will a systems administrator entrepreneur make? In Brazil, a beginning systems administrator typically makes about 1,000 US dollars a month. Doesn't sound very much to us, okay? but for them, that's a living. A good systems administrator might make about 1,800 to $2,000 a month. We believe that with, with Project Kawa, we can give them a base salary of $1,800 a month base with having 300 thin clients. And that would take them about 10 hours a week in steady state to monitor the system, to make sure it's working, to do the backups, to restore a few files, to get rid of spam and viruses and things like that. The rest of the time, the other 30 hours that they should have in a normal work week is going to be done like things like offering classes to their customers, to allow their customers to use the computer better. It's going to be doing things like doing exceptional work, creating websites for them, doing programming for them, other types of things, selling them additional hardware and software. So these people will be able to make additional money above the $1,800 that they would make as a good salary for a systems administrator. How do they buy this business? We're creating business plans to, it will be put up on the net for them to take, along with spreadsheets showing them how many thin clients they need for a given amount of, of cost of the thin clients, cost of the servers, cost of the installation, and to be able to pay back the loans that they take out on this. We're going to be going to the bank and working with the banks that they will understand this program and they will be able to understand that they will be paid back. Now, a lot of times in Brazil, to get a loan like this is very difficult because the banks are afraid they're not going to be paid back for this. So what we're doing is creating an underwriting program through Caixa Economia Federal, the state bank of Brazil, that every loan will have a small amount of money go into this underwriting program. If any individual loan is not paid back, then the bank gets this money back through the underwriting program. That eliminates the risk of any particular loan it means that the bank has no reason not to loan the money out. There's other funding models that do exist. There's three or four of them where, for example, the building owns the networking and the hardware, and they hire the systems administrator to run the business. Or the, there's a sharing of the equipment and the networking by the building and the, and the entrepreneur, and you know, back and forth. But there's different business models for different cases. 
This person is an entrepreneur. They basically are leasing these computer services out to these people. It's their job to keep them responsive. It's their job to rotate the old equipment out to people that need it. Let's say you have a beginning systems entrepreneur that needs a mama bear system and one who's been in business a while whose customers now need a papa bear. The original, the original uh, server could be sold off, selling off their mama bear server to the new entrepreneur, take that money to buy the papa bear server for their customers or to have a linear expansion. But in any case, they are their own boss. They keep their own hours. They might have an apprentice come in to help them and to teach them, and they will be trained and certified, licensed, and bonded. How large is this project? There's 194 million Brazilians, 86% in an urban environment means it's 167 million people in a potential market. If you reach that to its maximum with one thing client for a person at home, one thing client at work, one at home, one at school, that's 400 million thin clients, and in addition, about 70 million point of sale terminals. If you take this up into 300 thin clients on an average per highly available server, that's 1.3 million servers, but because they're highly available, it's 2.6 uh, million systems. Now, this is with 100% penetration. Now, I know 100% penetration is practically impossible. But even if we only have 10% penetration, that's 40 million thin clients. That means I generate 200,000 jobs. I can live with that. 1% penetration, only 4 million thin clients. I only generate 100,000 jobs, or 10,000 jobs, 20,000 jobs. It's OK. I can live with that, too. And this is only in Brazil. It's not counting the rest of Latin America. So technically, currently, we're in discussions with TradeComp, which is a manufacturer of thin clients, Telefonica, which is the largest telephone company in Latin America, the Brazilian government. I'm talking with the Minister of Communications about this. I'm talking with several banks about doing the underwriting program. And various housing and communication projects throughout Brazil are looking at this because the Brazilian government has a, as a project to bring at least one gigabit per second internet to every single house in Brazil within 10 years. And they say, well, it's one thing for us to bring the internet, but how do we bring the ability for people to use these computer systems and to be able to maintain their stuff? And Project Cower is one way. Uh, the current status is that we want to start a field test of what we call 0.5. We want to show that the biggest problem that we have right now is getting people to believe that geeks can actually run their own business, that geeks can actually be entrepreneurs, that geeks can actually sell stuff. That is the biggest problem. If we can show them that this could be done, then everything else follows. So version 0.5 is to create a baby step, to create a home entertainment system built out of XBMC that people can go out and sell. We create all the marketing information for them. We give them videos on how to sell to people. We allow them to sell this. We sign up 50 LPI, Linux Professional Institute, level two certified people to do this. And if each one of them can sell 100 of these systems, then we will have met our goal and we can prove to these people that this can be done. Then we can go into starting version 1.0 of the project which is the home automation vertical market we've been talking about, complete with server and thin clients, and start that project forward in the May to June time frame. After that, we turn everything on. When I say we turn everything on, everything we're going to be doing is going to be published on the Project Cower server. All of the software, all of the design for the hardware, all of the marketing materials, everything. Nobody will have to ask Project Cower if they can go and become a Project Kawa entrepreneur. They will have to be licensed by the government and bonded before they can go to the bank and get their loan. But nobody's going to have to ask Project Kawa's permission to do that. Nor will they have to pay Project Kawa any money. We'll get all of that back through uh, various things that Project Kawa will be selling that will help to fund Project Kawa. And we're having a pro an apprenticeship training program started in Argentina, modeled on an apprenticeship program that's already going on in Brazil, in, I'm sorry, in Britain. This is our board of directors. Everybody on here is Brazilian except for three people. Me, Daniel Coletti, who comes from Argentina. He's the person who's actually starting the apprenticeship program. 
And uh, Jody Newman, who's an American, who's a lawyer in international telecommunications laws, who's keeping us all legal. <laughs> we have a beginning of a technical board that we're going to be building. Dale Garby was the head of the Debian project at one time, is a technical person for Hewlett Packard. Uh, Felipe is a security expert. Gustav, uh, Gust, uh, Kav. Kav is from the GNOME project in Debian. And P Pablo is somebody who's helped us start the Debian project. We're going to keep building this as time goes on. How does this affect you? You know, in the United States right now, we have a bunch of places that could really use a little bit of help. Inner city Detroit, inner city Chicago, inner city Manhattan. And they also have high densities and tall buildings. And it's possible that some of these could be good places to put Project Kawa. Um, I would hope that some of our people who are talking about let's create jobs might listen to a little bit of this and might help to make it go forward a little bit. And again, if we only created 10,000 new jobs, but gave people better support, reduced electrical utilization, made computers more recyclable, I think it's worthwhile. So with that, here's where you find out more about Project Kawa. That is our symbol. It is the eagle against the sun, the eagle. Actually, Brazil has the largest eagle species in the world. This is the eagle, which is uh, a stylized eagle because Kawa is a Tupi Indian word for eagle. It also happens to be the name of my Brazilian godson, who's five years old. That's him. <laughs> he doesn't really have a tattoo on him. I just put that on with Gimp. <laughs> my next project, my retirement project after Project Kawa, is Mad Dog's Monastery and Marina of Math, Music, Microcomputing, Micro Winery, Micro Distillery, and Bait Shop. And uh, it'll probably be in Brazil. With that, I'll say any questions, comments, complaints, anything else, uh, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. So you, uh, you commented that you're planning on having all the thin clients be hardwired, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that brings to mind to me is the cost of wiring the buildings. I mean, mm -hmm. wiring a small building is expensive. Wiring a huge high-rise, much more expensive, of course. I guess my biggest question is, what class of wiring are you planning on using? I'm assuming it's not copper. Uh, it, it could either be copper or it could be fiber with, uh, but it has to be modified fiber because you have to carry the electricity over the wire too. And obviously, fiber doesn't do that that well. Right. Uh, so, you know, the, the thing is the cost. There's two things that mitigates the cost. Number one, every single apartment in the building, every single office in the building is going to be getting the wiring at the same time. Number two, this is paid for over a 10-year period. Remember, there's a loan that's paying for this. So you divide the time out. And number three, we're actually going to start with buildings that are being built now. Okay, so just like you say in a building, you don't build it without electrical wiring, you don't build it without plumbing, you don't build it without high-speed networking in it, okay? So we're going to approach those buildings first, and then over time, we're going to do the buildings that already exist, okay? But again, you do that through a financing program to bring that in anyway. Remember the Brazilian government's desire that every single apartment, every single household will have gigabit per second ethernet or internet, okay? We think this is the right way of doing this. A lot of people say, well, this is all going to be done wirelessly. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Every year I go to this great thing called Campus Party where they bring together 4,000, 6,000 geeks. Telefonica comes in. They have, they've had ever more complex antenna systems. And they say, this time, this year is going to work. Ten seconds into the conference, the whole thing just drops like a rock. Okay? And, then, and this is one of Hall's laws. No matter how much internet you give somebody, they'll use every single bit of it for downloading porn. <laughs> And when do we have 3D porn and smell a porn? You go too far.
다 먹는데. 헬로, <웃음> uh, I'm Rudy Givart from uh, Belgium. I work at Kent University, uh, but I also do development cooperation uh, in Ethiopia, for instance, and also in a, another uh, country not far from Brazil, but I won't name it. Uh, Why not? It's Cuba. Now I said it, so. <laughs> hey, I'm fine with Cuba. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> they make great cigars. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice country. Uh, what I see is that I'm doing the training, so I, we are trying to help people run their ICT center at universities. That's our main objective. Uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, the, the training is very difficult. For instance, that the people don't have a very good background in computer science. And the biggest problem is that the education system is not on the same level as Europe or America. I don't know in Brazil uh, how it is, but do you think that will be a problem? Because it, it's, I think it's okay, you are saying, okay, we give the people LPI trainings, but you already have a critical mass to deliver those trainings. Be so that's the question. Okay, so a couple things. I may have given the impression that Project Cow is something that's gonna be done overnight. I'm not a Pollyanna, okay? I believe that Project Kawa is the same type of is, is the same type of project it takes to electrify areas, to to create a mail system. You know, I mean, it, it's you know to, to put the telephone system in the first place, and therefore it's going to take ten years, fifteen years to do this. However, we do have certain goals that we want to meet besides just bringing the internet in. Now. As far as the training goes, we want to start with people who are already LPI certified because that allows us to test the rest of Project Kawa without having to worry too much about the training. The other thing about Project Kawa is it's a very defined type of systems administration. LTSP, it's all one type of architecture, Intel and structure set, not a mixed architecture in the beginning. Okay. It gives us time to train these people in these elements of doing this. And so we are going to reach out to people who already are computer science students, who already are people who know something about computers, and say to them, do you want this type of job? Now, as we get Project Calvary started, there's going to be more and more people who will see the light, will see the light bulb, and they'll say, hey, I can help to train people to do this. I can help to bring these people forward. I will enter into the apprenticeship program. So yes, it's a big training task, but it's, it's going to ramp up. It's not gonna be necessarily a step function, and it'll take some time to get there. But I do, th I do believe that we can do this. And there are government projects, like in the favelas, that try and bring training to these people to get them jobs. So some of the largest favelas in the world are in Rio de Janeiro. In the year 2014 and 2016, there's going to be two events, the World Cup held in Brazil and the Olympics. And Rio is going to be a major portion of that. They're going to build lots of hotels in Rio. Over time, those hotels will probably be going into uh, luxury condominiums, luxury apartments. They'll still need computer services and things like that. So they're gonna need people to help to run those and to train those, and Project Kawa is a perfect thing. To be able to take people in the favelas and train them to do that job so that they can meet the need in 2014 and 2016, and then have a job that would continue on from there. So you know, again, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna about this. And again, even if we only create you know, 20,000 new jobs, train 20,000 people, I can go to sleep at night. Really, I can. <laughs> uh, and maybe another question. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about the Freedom Box initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's more or less, you know, it's not similar or a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is far more bigger. Mm -hmm. Do you see any synergy that could happen? Uh, Dale Garby, who I mentioned before on our yeah. technical board, is the pro project leader for the Freedom Box. Okay. And Bidale and I have known each other for a long time. Um, what I see is the software of the Freedom Box. I didn't mention much about how this thing is going to help with security and integrity of the system. But we want everybody, we want all of the different people 
who are running on this system to be running in virtual machines on the server so that with, with encrypted databases, encrypted file systems, so they cannot see what the other people are doing. Likewise, the wireless mesh network is going to be operating in a virtual machine on the thin client with a virtual network so that it will be completely invisible from the network that's actually used by the end user itself. And because of that, um, we think that the, the virtual box could actually run as a virtual machine inside of the thin client and do much the same thing that Bedale is going to be doing by trying to sell these individual little boxes to go around. Because this system will always be on, always be connected, we think that it would be a, a viable alternative to buying the hardware for the Freedom Box. Thanks. Sure. What, what are, are there obstacles to training people from the favelas where it, for that, for, I, I, I mean, I, all I know about the favelas is what I saw in Black Orpheus and maybe a couple of newspaper articles. Don't, don't they have a serious crime problem? The big entrepreneurship going on right now there is drug dealing and gangs. How do you get um, Linux certified people and reliable sysadmins out of that environment? There's a person by the name of Marcelo Patelli who lives in one of those favelas. He started selling trinkets to, to uh, people on the, on the beach in Rio de Janeiro when he was eight years old. He learned after a while if he bought his trinkets in off season, he could sell them in high season and get them for less money and make more profit. He wanted to, to teach himself about computers. <laughs> the favela. People laughed at him. They say nobody will ever buy you services from you and you'll go broke. But he found enough people inside the favela, maybe they were drug dealers, I don't know, but who were willing to buy the services from him and then he could supply the services to other people who then developed companies and businesses themselves and then could pay him and now he supports seven or eight people in his little company selling wireless internet services throughout the favela. He applied to the government for a loan to start a small school to teach kids about systems administration and web design and stuff like that. And he said to me, Mad Dog, two years ago all the kids talked about was drugs and guns and now all they talk about is the internet and web design. They don't want to do drugs. 90%, 99% of the people there don't want to do drugs. They just want to get by. But they need something. Okay. And what he has done, what Marcelo has done, is give them that something. I've met some of these kids, and you can look in their eyes, you can see the intelligence, you can see the drive, and those are the kids I want. I don't care about the drug dealers. I care about the kids. Next. Thank you.